everybody. It's the lady I told you about from my dreams. Welcome to Ms. Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 times Nickelodeon shows tackled serious issues. People with special needs skiing and snowboarding. It was amazing. I'm totally sure the guys hadn't ever seen anything like that either. For this list, we're looking at instances where Nickelodeon helped its young audience navigate their way through heavy dilemmas, showing just how adult this kid's network could be. Which Nickelodeon shows did you grow up with? Let us know in the comments. Number 20. Saying Goodbye to a Friend. The Adventures of Pete and Pete. What is it? Well, I... had a thing. I did. Although Pete and Pete possessed a surreal edge, there was always a sense of honesty to the characters, scenarios, and suburban setting. Not every kid can identify with having their own personal superhero like Artie, the strongest man in the world. Artie had something to tell Pete. It wasn't just the story of being tricked by Dad or hired by McFlemp or working for 10% commission. Sooner or later, though, everybody must learn to say goodbye to a friend. In season two, Artie finds that little Pete is big enough to stand up for himself, deciding to seek out another kid who needs a hero. Everything you need to learn is in here. Out there is some boy who needs me. It's the last we ever see of Artie in the series, making his departure all the more impactful. Whereas most kid-centric shows revert to the status quo, Artie's exit taught us that things change. But oftentimes, that's necessary to awaken our inner heroes. But will I ever see you again? <laughs> Worry not, boy. Worry not. For I am Artie, the strongest man now. <laughs> Number 19. Having Divorced Parents. Clarissa Explains It All. Not long before landing the role of Clarissa, Melissa Joan Hart's parents divorced and she moved to Manhattan with her mom. Somewhat mirroring Hart's life, the show tackled divorce on multiple occasions. In season two, Clarissa fears her parents might split amid a fight. Although their marriage survives, Clarissa's best friend Sam understands what it's like to have divorced parents. Well, I'm supposed to go live with my mom. Your mom's moving back here? Not exactly here. Exactly where, then? Seattle. Living with his father, Sam is distraught when his estranged mother returns, wanting to take him back to Seattle. Do you want to move? No. Well, then don't! Don't go! Clarissa, you don't understand. She's my mom. I don't have a choice. The show definitely doesn't vilify Sam's mom, who wants a relationship with her son. It's time for me to kiss my wild years goodbye and take a shot at the motherhood gig. <laughs> Sam would like that too, but not at the expense of leaving his life behind. The two come to a mature and relatable resolution, albeit with more roller skating than one might expect. Actually, it looks like Sam will be around for a while. Really? That's great! I mean, is that great? It definitely is. But don't you worry, we'll be seeing a lot more of each other from now on. <laughs> Number 18. Leaving for College. Blue's Clues. The internet is swarming with rumors as to why Steve Burns left Blue's Clues. I'm gonna miss you. The truth is that Burns, who was almost 30, simply felt he was getting too old for the role. This was reflected through his balding head, which he wanted to shave. Steve passed the notebook to Donovan Patton, who played his little yet taller brother Joe. Will you take good care of my brother Joe? While I'm at college. The showrunner saw this as a learning opportunity for the audience. Rather than unceremoniously write Steve out of the show, a three-part episode explained that he was leaving for college on a hopscotch scholarship. Well, guess I'm off to college. You mean it's time for so long? We could have majored in that? Steve's departure could resonate with young viewers who had older siblings leaving for school while also preparing them for the day they leave home. You know, with me and you, and our friend Blue, we can do anything that we want to do. It's the bus. The bus is here. Number 17, Accepting Adulthood, The Fairly Odd Parents. When you're an animated character like Timmy Turner, you can remain a perpetual 10-year-old. 
On occasion, though, the Fairly Odd franchise has contemplated what it would be like if Timmy grew up. On this show, the good guy always wins! You young fool, don't you understand? I am the good guy! The most poignant example is the TV movie Channel Chasers, in which Timmy attempts to escape the inevitability of reaching adulthood and losing his fairies. If you're supposed to be me, why don't you know where you are? I... Pause! Timmy, he's you as a grown-up! Upon meeting his future self and reconnecting with his parents, Timmy accepts that life can't always be like a TV show. The ending is bittersweet, as Timmy becomes an adult and forgets about his childhood fairies. Ah oh well, time to go to work. However, Cosmo and Wanda keep close to Timmy by looking after his children. Some fans would argue that this could have served as a fitting series finale, seeing Timmy come of age. Like father, like son! Tell me about it! Number 16. Finding a new home. Caitlin's Way. Caitlin's Way stood out from Nickelodeon's usual live-action fare as a teen drama. Being a Nick show, the content wasn't as risque as what you'd see on the WB. At least your mother didn't suffer. How do you know? She had an aneurysm. She died instantaneously. The setup was quite mature for early 2000s Nickelodeon, however. 14-year-old Caitlin was abandoned by her father at age four and lost her mother at eight. No one ever told me. They just took me away and put me in a home. She spends several years jumping between foster parents, who merely see her as a free check. Caitlin, that you? Heard that better be her. That social worker woman's gonna be here any minute now. After a run-in with the law gets her expelled, the city girl goes to live with her estranged relatives in Montana as an alternative to juvenile detention. The series regularly tackled themes such as grief, adjusting to a different environment, and overcoming the stigma of being a troubled teen, taking Nick to bolder territory. We're your family. I don't need any more families. Number 15. Steroid Use – Cat Dog you wouldn't expect a Nicktoon about a conjoined canine and feline to address many serious issues, yet the episode Pump paints a surprisingly believable, even uncomfortable portrait of steroid side effects. <laughs> I did it! I did it! Yo, dog! I did it! I'll eat those bugs for breakfast! <laughs> To stand up to the greasers, Cat gets Dog hooked on a protein drink, which in retrospect is a pretty obvious stand-in for steroids. Hey, looking good, champ. Yeah, yeah, buddy. While the drink gives Dog enough muscles to make Cujo cower in fear, it also changes him from a pacifist to a bloodthirsty animal. What the heck happened to you? Log off. Tends to sound busy. After Dog takes things beyond the usual realm of cartoon violence, Cat intervenes as the voice of reason, telling him that aggression isn't the answer. The lesson is clear, but there's one thing we don't get. The protein shakes are chocolate-flavored. Isn't that fatal for dogs? Number 14. Normalizing LGBTQ plus characters – The Loud House Growing up in the 90s and 2000s, kids rarely, if ever, saw LGBTQ plus characters represented on networks like Nickelodeon. The Loud House has sought to rectify this with characters like Howard and Harold McBride, the first married gay couple in Nicktoon history. Sorry dinner's nothing fancy, just roasted organic chicken with a homemade marinade and vegetables from our garden. The show took its depiction of same-sex couples another step further in the episode L is for Love, as Luna attempts to profess her feelings for a student named Sam. Although it's suggested that her crush is male, Sam is revealed to be a girl, and she reciprocates Luna's feelings. Sam isn't a one-off character, either. Future episodes establish Sam as Luna's girlfriend, with her family providing support, showing children that it's normal for love to flourish in many different forms. I know we don't have a lot in common, but maybe we can discover new things we both like. You know, like, together. I'd really like that. And uh, next time, I'll try not to hit you with any lasers. Number 13. Discrimination in Sports – Nickelodeon Sports Theater with Shaquille O'Neal Despite having a high-profile host in Shaq, this anthology series had a brief run and hasn't been made widely available since the 90s. You say what? We say Snick. Now you're talking. Regardless, the show was praised upon release for its honest depiction of overcoming adversity in sports. 
the characters felt real, as did their challenges. 15. 15? What? Inches? <laughs> the first installment, Four Points, centers on a 4'11 teen attempting to prove his worth on a high school basketball court. Hey, there goes that kid Luke. He's got game. Dad, I need to hear that. The show also received a Humanitas Prize nomination for its second episode, First Time. Taking place in 1947, African-American Troy Davis aspires to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers, but others see this as a pipe dream due to his skin color. If Jackie Robinson proved anything, though, it's that barriers can be broken. I'm gonna play shortstop for the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> You're gonna play for the Dodgers and I'm gonna be the president. Don't let the ugliness outside destroy the beauty within you. Number 12. Disabilities. Rocket Power. From one sports show to another, Rocket Power revolved around various extreme activities. People with special needs skiing and snowboarding. It was amazing. I'm totally sure the guys hadn't ever seen anything like that either. In season two, the kids meet a group of snowboarders with disabilities, including a girl named Lizzie with a metal leg. I wonder if she bums out about her condition. It doesn't look like she's bumming out. Although Lizzie stands out from the Rocket Power crew, she's just as competitive and every bit as capable on the slopes. The kids also learn about a surfer who continued to pursue his passion after losing his eyesight. He didn't let anything hold him back from living his life to the fullest. In fact, he used it to his advantage. Reggie is nonetheless compelled to throw a race. While her heart was in the right place, Reggie finds that Lizzie just wants to be treated equally. I win races all the time, and not because other people let me win. I just want to be treated like everyone else. The episode effectively gets this message across, earning an award from the disability advocacy group, TASH. Number 11, Body Insecurity. Doug. I couldn't remember whether you like chocolate fudge or butterscotch on your ice cream, so I brought both. <laughs> Here you go, sweetie. From the titular character's big nose to his bad hair days, Doug often tackled the physical insecurities we experience. You're here. You're home. You're huge. Doug tips the scales in particular will resonate with anyone who's ever had reservations about being seen in a swimsuit. Putting on some extra pounds, Doug attempts to shed them in time for a pool party. He takes his diet and exercise into overdrive, all while having nightmares about his weight and how others will view him. Even after getting back to his original weight, Doug remains insecure. Arriving at the party, though, Doug finds that he isn't the only self-conscious one motivating everyone else to be comfortable in their own skin. Doesn't anybody want to go in? I burn easily. I just ate. It's way too hot to swim. Uh, it's, it's nice to just look at the water. The Doug crew further explored this issue upon making the leap to Disney. Number 10. Learning You're Adopted – Rocco's Modern Life Even when your family loves you, learning that you're adopted can come as a life-changing blow. Come to my parents' house for dinner? Sure, Heath. Really? Of course. It's a sensitive topic that needs to be approached with care. Welcome home, son! Oh, Heifer, it's so good to see you! Good to see you too, Mom. So when Rocco accidentally spills the beans that Heifer was adopted, the Wolf family is sent into turmoil. In all the years I've known him, he never once told me he was adopted. Granted, Rocco thought Heifer knew, since the rest of his family are wolves. Of course, Heifer isn't the sharpest steer in the herd. We found you under a tree in Brandwin Farms. You were skinny, so we decided to fatten you up. But then we grew to love you. Creator Joe Murray drew inspiration from an adopted friend and the emotions he worked through. Although he initially feels betrayed and lost, Heifer finds that family and biology aren't always a package deal. The wolves may have wanted to eat Heifer at first, but they came to care for him as a member of their pack. That's family. Oh, Heifer, where did you go? I went looking for my real family, but I found out that you're my real family after all. Number 9. A Missing Child – The Wren and Stimpy Show Nickelodeon was full of unique family dynamics, from wolves raising steers to a cat giving birth to a fart. <laughs>
After passing gas for the first time, Stimpy's beloved Stinky disappears into thin air. It sounds ridiculous and immature, and yeah, it is. Despite being a satire of melodramas, the episode does capture the very real grief of losing a child. It's been three years now. I'm starting to worry about you. I don't care. Stimpy sinks into a great depression, hopelessly searching the snowy streets for his son. Even though everyone tells him that it's a lost cause. Poor little Stinky's out there in the cold. Lost. Alone. While not every separated parent and child reunite, Stimpy and Stinky have a happy ending. Stinky! As soon as Stimpy gets Stinky back, he must learn another valuable lesson, the importance of letting go. Who says heart and farts can't go together? I thought <laughs> I'd never smell you again. Number 8. Pandemics – SpongeBob SquarePants In 2014, President Barack Obama theorized that a pandemic may be on the horizon. What is this stuff anyway? <laughs> Doesn't seem to be coming off. SpongeBob was even further ahead of the curve, as the show explored the nature of contagious outbreaks in 2007. SpongeBob! <laughs> okay, so we doubt that the creators made this episode with the mindset that a global pandemic could happen in the next decade or so. What's wrong with your skin? Oh, Dad! It's nothing really, Squidward. Just a little blemish, that's all. <laughs> But watching it today, it's hard not to see the real-world parallels. What starts with a seemingly insignificant hunk of fungus grows out of control when SpongeBob infects himself and subsequently endangers others by going to work. I wanna go home! You are home, SpongeBob. You just need to stay in this bubble until the ick clears up. By the time SpongeBob is quarantined, the fungus is already spreading. Sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? If only a snail could come along and de-ick a situation like this in real life. Step up to be de-icked! Only five dollars! Number 7. Dying Young and Letting Go – Are You Afraid of the Dark? Five years before The Sixth Sense, Are You Afraid of the Dark produced an episode with a similar twist and message about death. Teenager Johnny is drawn to the mysterious Donna, who is either a dream girl or a nightmare. Who are you? How do you know me? You must know. You're wearing my ring. He eventually pieces together that Donna is a ghost. But that's not the whole story. Johnny was in the same accident that claimed Donna's life, and he's a ghost as well. The episode isn't just about Johnny coming to terms with his premature death. Don't you understand? It's you that I want. You must know that by now. Just, just, just leave me alone. It's time, Johnny. No! His sister Erica, the only living person who can see him, wanted to keep Johnny by her side beyond the grave. Erica ultimately accepts that her brother needs to pass on, leaving us with one of the show's grimmest yet still hopeful endings. Goodbye, Johnny. I love you. I love you too. Number 6. PTSD – The Legend of Korra In the 80s and 90s, we occasionally saw very special episodes that would address serious issues in half an hour. In an era of serialized storytelling, though, serious issues can be explored over multiple episodes. Bye, Cora! Get better soon! Don't forget to write! The fourth and final season of this series was largely dedicated to Cora's emotional turmoil following a near-fatal encounter the previous season. <sighs> On the road to recovery, Cora finds that psychological trauma and physical trauma are more closely linked than she realized. I know you're frustrated, but- Of course I'm frustrated! A crazy man poisoned me, and now I can't dress myself, or cook for myself, or, or do anything for myself! Initially fleeing into isolation, Cora eventually sees that she needs to accept help from others and confront her fears to move forward. <sighs> 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 While Cora can't undo the trauma that she endured, she does regain her fighting spirit, emerging a balanced person again. Number 5. Depression – As Told by Ginger 
As Told by Ginger is another Nickelodeon show that received praise for its continuity, character development, and mature themes. This Emmy-nominated episode touches upon the dark side of the preteen experience. For a contest, Ginger writes a beautiful yet bleak poem about a girl who wishes to disappear. She didn't have companions, no need for earthly things only wanted freedom from what she felt were puppet strings." Ms. Zorsky fears that the depressing poem may reflect Ginger's own turmoil, suggesting she see the school psychologist. Ginger finds that there may indeed be a part of her in the poem, but these feelings are not uncommon. By discussing them with others, Ginger emerges with a better understanding of herself while also seeing that she isn't alone. Creator Emily Kapnick based the episode on a play she wrote in the seventh grade, adding to the authentic emotions. If I'd have known you were, like, clinically depressed, I might have gone a little easier on you. Number 4. Neglectful Parents – Hey Arnold This Nicktoon frequently explored serious issues, especially ones involving parent-child dynamics. From Mr. Wynn giving up his daughter during the Vietnam War… He said there was only room for one of us to Arnold feeling abandoned by his parents. You're not a bad short man. I'm, I'm scared I can't find my mommy and daddy. The show spoke to adults and children alike. Helga stands out as the character with the most emotional baggage, hiding her insecurities behind a fist. When one violent encounter lands Helga in a psychologist's office, she discusses her problems at home. Daddy, who's gonna take me to play school? Eh? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. C come on, play us another one, Olga. Helga has always felt like an outsider in her family, carrying that sense of unwantedness everywhere she goes. In a minute, Olga. No, I'm Helga, Dad. Helga. Whatever. Go play outside. Helga's family doesn't pay attention to her. But Dr. Bliss reassures her that there are others who will listen. Hi, nice bow. Huh? I like your bow. She encourages Helga to keep expressing herself and open up about her feelings at her own leisure. Number 3. The Loss of a Parent – Rugrats When you're a baby, learning to master the potty is usually your biggest problem. Some children are forced to grow up faster than others, however. Look, everybody! It's the lady I told you about from my dreams! Before even turning three, Chucky Finster confronted death multiple times. Not long after his beloved pill bug Melville dies, Melville! My minute he was fine in the next. I want him back! Chucky, don't worry, we got you a new bug. I don't want a new bug! Chucky learns about his mother. Nickelodeon had previously rejected pitches for episodes that would have revealed that Chucky's parents were divorced or that his mom had passed. Following co-creator Paul Germain's departure, the network finally signed off on a special dealing with the loss of Chucky's mom. I think it's time you shared these things with Chucky. Well, I'm just afraid he'll miss her. Then you can miss her together. Just as Nickelodeon was initially reluctant, Chaz attempts to shield Chucky from the truth. He ultimately finds, though, that Chucky deserves to know about his mom. Chucky, this is your mommy. This was her trowel. It's a little shovel for gardening. It may hurt, but addressing pain can leave you with comfort. See, guys? I do have a mom. She's right here in the flowers. Number 2. HIV and AIDS – Nick News with Linda Ellerby Although aimed at a younger demographic, this news program covered a wide range of important issues, from politics to sexism to climate change. Ignorance is not bliss. You don't go to heaven if you die dumb. That's what this show is about. The most daring episode ever produced explored HIV and AIDS. Because of the, the HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers. Airing several months after publicly announcing that he was HIV positive, Magic Johnson sat down with host Linda Ellerby and several children to answer their questions. If I, if I got HIV, I'd probably be like crying and screaming all over the place. But how do you learn to like, you know, live with it? At a time when misinformation remained widespread, Johnson provided an honest portrait of living with HIV AIDS. I want people to know that we're just normal people. Mm -hmm. Aww. 
<laughs> it builds to an especially powerful moment when Johnson comforts a little girl with HIV, Hydea Broadbent, assuring her that she's normal. We are normal people, okay? We are. In addition to giving all the facts, the episode encourages its audience to be compassionate. It's a message people needed in 1992 and still need now. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. War – Avatar The Last Airbender After the attack, they rounded up my father and every other Earthbender and took them away. We haven't seen them since. A world war provides the backdrop of this groundbreaking show, which combined fantastical elements with real-world horror. Who's that? Monkey Atso, the greatest airbender in the world. He taught me everything I know. Early in the series, the titular last airbender learns that his entire nation was wiped out, making him the sole survivor. Firebenders? They were here? The fact that we actually see the skeletal remains of Aang's mentor only adds to the tragedy. Avatar would further tackle imperialism, dictatorship, and colonialism throughout its three-season run. Being a prisoner of war was also a common theme. I prefer to think of you not as prisoners, but as honored guests. Lake Laogai even derives its name from Laotong Gai Tsao, or reform through labor, a criminal law system employed by the People's Republic of China. I can't swim! Don't worry, I hear cowards float. At its core, Avatar is about knowing when to fight and when to seek peace, finding the balance needed to move beyond war.